Welcome everyone to the July 21st edition of Quarantine Chats. Uh, thanks for joining on. We do often have a lot of people who join us on Facebook Live or YouTube after the fact. So uh, as usual, I wanted to point out there's a link on the homepage of our website. Go to entreflow.com, click on the Join Quarantine Chats link, and it's a couple clicks and you can get right into the chat for today or for the next one if you so choose. Um, I'll run through the agenda for today. So we're going to start with the news. And uh, then, of course, we're going to get into some details about uh, IRAP and some details about Shred. We have some content prepared for, for those things, and we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing some more. Um, and we'll also hopefully touch on about uh, using these and perhaps other government programs together uh, to best effect. And certainly, we're hoping for some good um, Q&A as we go through here. Um, we're hoping that this is a, uh, a discussion and not just us sitting here talking. So um, uh, please make sure and uh, set your chat window to all panelists and attendees. Uh, so if you want to say something, everyone will hear it. Um, and uh, you can type in a question into the Q&A feature, which is available either at the top of or bottom of your screen if you hold your mouse over. Or of course, you can raise your hand if you want to come on microphone and uh, and ask your question that way. Sometimes it's easier to convey your particular scenario um, that way. And uh, before we get started properly, I'll introduce ourselves. Many of you know me already, uh, the founder of uh, EntreFlow and uh, de facto host of the uh, Quarantine Chats. Uh, joining me today are uh, Richard Hoy from uh, Catax and Eric Kass from NRC IRAP. Um, why don't you uh, introduce yourselves? Uh, go ahead, Richard. So as, as you said, I'm Richard Hoy. I'm the president of CATEX. Uh, CATEX is um, a company that works specifically on Shred. We have uh, 14,500 plus clients who are recurring, who work with us every year um, across six countries. And we've been going for about uh, 12 and a half years, and we've got about 140 staff who are dedicated to this one one thing, and we're pretty good at it. Is that Thank what you. you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a, a good good short intro there. Thank you. Uh, Eric, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Eric Kass. I'm with uh, the NRC IRAP program, one of the advisors uh, based in Vancouver. Um, I primarily work with uh, software companies because prior to joining IREP uh, seven years ago, I, uh, I worked for about 20 years with uh, local Vancouver-based software startups and companies. Uh, so that's where my expertise is. And I'm part of a bigger team in, in BC. We have about 30 or so people. And across the country, IREP has about 300 people uh, working with small and medium-sized businesses to help them uh, with their innovations. Very good. Thank you for joining us, you both. Um, introducing EntreFlow, for those of you who haven't heard of us, we're a boutique uh, consulting firm. Uh, we focus on accounting, CFO services, HR, and marketing for a specific type of company, which is um, those that are um, in their you know, early growth stage, we work with a lot of, uh, of startups who are looking to, to scale up and they need those um, systems in place, some financial discipline, and, uh, and that CFO seat doing some planning, uh, maybe some HR planning and hiring, all that kind of good stuff. So we're a team of uh, 15 people or so, and we've been at this for almost five years now, and are uh, proud to have served uh, dozens and dozens of companies uh, locally in Vancouver and, and across Canada. Uh, we're also joined today by Colin Weston, um, and pleased to have the support of Startup uh, Vancouver um, on these uh, QT chats. You want to say hi, Colin? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. And Ian, by the way, your hair with your background today is looking spectacular. <laughs> Amazing. 
<laughs> Thank you. So good. I don't know what we're going to call that one. We're going to come up with a name for that one there. Maybe the QT look, because I don't know what it is. Yeah, uh, <laughs> quickly, I, yeah, I'm Colin Weston. I am an entrepreneur, but the other hat I wear is I am the, the co-founder and community leader for Startup Vancouver, which is one of over 40 chapters of Startup Canada across the country. And we are the voice of the over 3.5 million entrepreneurs in the country. And we host events and collaborate and co-present on others with amazing partners like Entreflow with QT Chats. And we are very honored and pleased to be part of this for, gosh, almost four months running. So again, Ian, thank you so much for everything that you do and, uh, and, and the knowledge and creativity and connectivity that you provide. Thank you so much. Um, I'll do the news. And um, we had a, an interesting announcement um, as of yesterday that there were some uh, program uh, adjustments to the, uh, the SUS wage subsidy. So th this is the, uh, what we were calling the 70% um, wage subsidy for businesses that were impacted by, by COVID. Now, of course, the, the percentages are, are changing and the way they're structuring the program is changing. So um, this is, at this point, uh, me just communicating that I've seen an announcement and I've read through it briefly. Um, I don't have all the knowledge uh, of having spent hours with this thing uh, to understand all the ins and outs of how uh, it has changed. Um, also, I want to note that uh, it appears that the announcement has been made um, by the Ministry of Finance. Um, however, the legislation uh, has been drafted and shared around, but hasn't actually been enacted yet. So um, there may be some slight changes as it goes through, not sure, um, but uh, we're hoping that uh, we'll see some uh, concrete answers on, on this in the coming weeks. For now, what we can say, uh, at least, is that uh, it appears that um, uh, the uh, government has listened to some feedback from the community about um, the fairness of the program and also uh, sort of thinking about as businesses emerge from um, being closed and revenues start to recover, then what? And, uh, you know, maybe they're not still at, um, at the level that they need to be uh, to run effectively, um, but, uh, but the subsidy is, is then not available to them. So, uh, so thinking about that, it, it seems that um, uh, the good people behind this use program have, uh, have put some thought into how to restructure it. And um, they've got this graph here is taken from, uh, from their webpage, and I'll post the link in just a second here. Um, and it shows how the subsidy uh, might scale with um, revenue changes. So it's, it's nice to know that businesses who, are, who haven't um, haven't been uh, haven't taken a thirty percent revenue hit, uh, but are still affected. Um, would still be uh, would be eligible now to receive some uh, some subsidy, um, and uh, it's just on a sort of declining rate kind of basis. Uh, the other thing that you can see is in the colors over here. It kind of indicates um, how the subsidy rate will change over time. Um, and uh, so it's sort of uh, a diminishing rate. So let's say you were at that 30% mark, um, it would start close to you know, 35, 40%, uh, and then decline over time as we get towards the end of 2020. So um, at this point, what we're hearing is that the subsidy will go through till the end of this year. Um, and that's all we know for now. Uh, what we've learned from, uh, from these programs over the course of the past uh, few months is that um, the government is, is willing to recognize it and adapt to changing situations. So we may look out for other changes as the program evolves in uh, Q4. So there you go, uh, an update there and just a heads up to, hey, talk to your accountants, talk to your payroll providers. Um, and see what, uh, what you might be eligible for um, and how to calculate that thing. But please give them a few days to read this and, and sort of fully digest it. Um, uh, we're hoping to, to talk further about this on QT Chats. Um, I'm anticipating in the next week or two. Um, just have to give us some time to wrap our heads around it and then we can 
answer questions intelligently about it. Um, are there any questions uh, from people uh, joined on the line about uh, this announcement, just initial reactions uh, or any questions that I can take away um, and try and get answers for, for the team about? Just pause there for a second. And while I'm pausing, I'll, I'll sort of paste this link into the chat. Okay, well, if there are any questions about this, um, just type it into the chat. I'd be really interested to know what you're thinking so that I can go, go ahead and try, try to run through some scenarios um, over the course of the next week or two. All right, uh, so that's the SUS. Um, in positive news, other positive news, um, I saw a, uh, a, an announcement about uh, a vaccine program led um, out of Oxford, and there's collaborations, I think, in, in Canada and China as well around this and with AstraZeneca. Um, so they appear to be moving into the sort of mix of phase two, three clinical trials, and they're getting some positive responses. So, um, so that's nice news. And I'm posting again the link to the vaccine tracker. Um, there's a new one out there. It's different from the one that I shared before, um, but I'll copy this link into the chat as well. And you can see um, some progress that's happening around the world on, on vaccines uh, for, for COVID. So response around these things has been optimistic and that's always good for the business environment. Um, people feeling more optimistic about how things are, are gonna go. And that is the positive news. So at this point, I'll um, uh, pass it over to Eric um, to take us through uh, one of the main topics of the day, which is, um, which is IRAP. Uh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, got a few slides to present this morning. We'll probably take about uh, 15 minutes um, since we have a relatively uh, limited number of participants. I think if there's any questions along the way, we can uh, probably squeeze them in. Um, other ways at the end of the presentation, we can open it up for uh, for questions. But uh, we'll do the next slide. So IRAP is a federal program. Um, it's so so we'll we'll hear later about Shred, which is by far the largest R and D based program in Canada. Um, IRAP is probably one of the most popular ones um, because it's uh, it's one of the programs that can help earlier stage companies. Um, accelerate their innovation. Um, the program was really created to help uh, stimulate wealth creation for Canada through innovation. So that's sort of the very big picture um, overriding goal. Um, and the way we do that is uh, to provide uh, small and medium sized enterprises. So any company with less than 500 employees um, to help them accelerate their growth um, by providing both advice and, in some cases, funding for their R&D activities. Next slide. So the way companies work with IREP is that you basically end up working with an advisor like myself. Uh, we have over 300 across the country. Um, so we're typically in every region and every location. Um, some of us are more specialized. Um, but you basically end up building a relationship with your advisor. Uh, they get to know you, you get to know them, um, and the advisor um, are all people that have worked in industry. Right? So we don't have sort of the typical government employees that, uh, that provide advice. We actually hire only business people that have typically worked for 15, 20 years in technology-based startups. So uh, all of us have kind of been there, done that. So we help you with advice based on our experience uh, will help you with advice based on pulling in our colleagues um, and, and vast resources. Um, and we typically can provide and, and, and help companies with advice, which is sometimes more valuable than the actual funding. Um, we also do what we call linkages and referrals. So connecting you to other government programs or giving you some advice on, on how to work with other programs. Um, and then finally, um, in some cases, if we think there's a good business case and funding is available, um, IREP does provide funding, which is probably number one reason why people contact us and people people will like IREP. Um, but we have a set budget every year, 
um, that's limited across the country. Um, so we cannot support every company that qualifies and contacts us. Um, so in the end, the advisor like myself, uh, we decide if and when it's a good time to support a company and then, and then uh, provide funding to them for their R&D activities. Um, we also do other type programs. It's kind of all um, the same money, but, but in the end we have R&D projects. Uh, we sometimes provide funding for hiring youth, um, which are smaller, smaller dollar amounts. And we also have funding that's dedicated to help companies with international collaboration with, uh, with, with firms outside of Canada. I think there was a question flying by. Uh, yeah, do you target a sector? Um, well, I'll, I think I have a slide on that a bit later. Yeah. Okay. We'll do the next slide. Um, so from an eligibility perspective, um, it doesn't take a lot to actually qualify for IRAP. Um, the basic eligibility is that you're a for-profit company in Canada, less than 500 employees, which is like 99% of companies, um, and that you are doing uh, or that you're trying to grow through the use of technology. So that can be either uh, developing a new product that's technology-based or leveraging technology to uh, deliver a different business model or something like that. Um, but again, because we have a limited budget or a set budget each year and more companies then uh, apply than we can support, it's inherently what we call a competitive program, right? So. Out of, out of 10 companies that I talk to every, every time, I would say that about one or maybe two end up getting funding. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's very competitive. And that's based on our assessment of both the business opportunity and, and the use of technology to support that business opportunity, right? So um, we're kind of like investors in that we don't just look at the technology side. Um, a program like Shred, for example, only cares about the technology is it in, is it experimental in nature? They don't really care about the underlying business or, or the opportunity to grow. Um, but we do look at that. We look at um, what is the opportunity, how are you managed, what are your financial capabilities, um, and, and look at it from a potential for growth. And then if we like that, then the project still needs to be an R&D project where you're developing something new and innovative. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, 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 the dual sides of IREP, where we look at a balance of both the business and the technology to support that growth. Okay. Can you comment on the stage of the company? Can, can very early stage companies apply? Um, or what level of maturity is needed? I also go into that a bit later. So let's hold off until that. Okay. Um, because I think I covered that in a few slides. So we'll go to the next one. Sure. Which I think is uh, addressing that first question, which is the industry sector. Um, so because we broadly define technology um, as more of an enabler that, than, than something core, it, it spans a lot of industries. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, some industries like, like the digital companies, software companies, um, there's a lot more of them than, than in other sectors. But you can see here that it's, it's, it's fairly balanced um, across all sectors, with the big outlier being uh, software, ICT it's called. Um, which just has a lot of smaller companies being active. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's no industry sector that we prefer or that we, uh, or that we specifically target. It's, it's really on a case by case basis. If there's a good opportunity, then it's a good fit. Um, the reason why ICT is so large is just because it's, it, it, it just a larger number of, of companies that are in that space compared to the other subsectors. Mm -hmm. What does ICT stand for? um information communication technology so Got i it. think it's kind of a 70s 80s time term that we're still using in the government so sure. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, most of those are software companies so, so SaaS, mm -hmm. um, but it also covers sort of hardware-based uh tech companies right so telecom would be part of that for example okay gotcha and would uh, it, you said it's a sort of case by case basis? So um, you're saying ICT is very competitive. There's a lot of applicants for that. Um, it, are they more or less likely than uh, someone in the other industries to uh, to proceed with the the program, or it really is just case by case? It doesn't matter. 
Well, it's case by case, but the reality is, is that uh, depending on where the company is based, um, mm -hmm. for example, if you were, happen to be a company in Toronto or Vancouver, you're yeah. obviously competing with a lot more startups than if you were based in, uh, in, in, in a different um, part of the country typically, right? So if you're, if you're based in a rural area, I've got a local call coming in here, but um, hopefully you don't hear that too much in the background. Um, so yeah, the competitiveness is more based on where you're located. Uh, for example, Vancouver, I always call it hyper competitive mm -hmm. uh, because there's just a lot of software startups here. So that's, so, so your odds of being one of the better ones is just lower based on the volume. Um, if you're based in Atlantic Canada or in the provinces, in the, in the prairies, um, there's just less companies there that you're competing with. So your odds go up a little bit just based on the numbers game. But yeah, we're not, we're not preferring any company. Like we look at the opportunity that that company provides and, and, and how that fits in with the industry that they're, they're playing in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems William is full of questions today. Uh, so the, his other question is, if you get Shred, will you ne necessarily get IRAP? Are the two related? I, I think we're going to talk about that topic after we hear all about Shred. So we'll, I'll park that one for later, William, and we'll come back to it. Yeah, yeah, I think here in the question, they are, it, it, it's not an automatic one, uh, but if you do shred eligible work, uh, that's sort of a good pre-qualifier for IRAP because we also need you to do something that's technology-based and innovative. So if it happens to be eligible for shreds, that kind of ticks one of the IRAP boxes. Um, so, so, so it's a good starting point. Very good. Good. So we'll go into some more of the details and a lot of this is not written in stone. It's, uh, it, it's really each individual an ITA. So that's my official title. It stands for industrial technology advisor. Um, so we're the ones that work with companies and ultimately uh, decide if it's a, it's a good fit or not. Um, like, like we all have our own sort of opinions and interest and, and, and views on what makes a good company. Um, so it really depends a bit on which ITA you're working on, but, but again, we all have experience and we're typically working with companies that are in our area of expertise. So we can make that assessment uh, quite well, I think. Um, but as I, as I mentioned before, we kind of look at things more like angel investors or, or VCs do, right? We look at the holistic opportunity of the company. Um, what you do need to have is, is have some funding already in place to cover your part of the project. Um, sometimes that's in kind if you're bootstrapping, but, but yeah, if, if you're looking for IREP as your single source of funding, um, odds are you're not going to get that, right? So you need, to, you need to have something in place to already cover your portion of the project and, and, and pay for the ongoing aspects of the business. Um, you need to have engaged with an like, like you need to have an opportunity that's in an attractive market that has potential, right? So you need to be able to demonstrate that. So you need to know about your market that you're going after, but you also need to demonstrate that um, your solution fills a role and, 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 and is of value in that specific target market. Um, what we look for is like a lot of companies will talk to us and they'll totally emphasize the technology and how it's, how it's the greatest thing since sliced breast, of course. But we need to hear from you, what is your uh, business model? What is your go-to-market plan? What is your plan for growing the business and, and, and selling the product in addition to how, how cool and sexy the technology is? And then, of course, we, we look at the people running the business. Um, who is the management? What is their background? What's their experience? What's their ability to execute? Um, and if there's gaps there, what is kind of your, your plan to grow into? Uh, the, the, the potential of the company. Next one. Sure. So keeping that in mind, here, here's a bit more details on, on what we look for. Again, this, this is just guidelines, right? So don't take this too literal, but um, if, 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 if you're more on the left side of this than on the right side, it, you might be a bit early for, for IRAP support. Um, we see a lot of companies that come to us and say like, Hey, I've got this brilliant idea. I just need money to build it. Um, so if it's just an idea, you probably need to either find some seed funding 
or bootstrap yourself to do a bit of product market validation. Um, if there's not a lot of technology going on, um, and this is where it's, where it's sort of linked to Shred, um, if, it, if it's not really, if technology is not a key part of, of what's gonna make this company stand out, it's probably not a good fit. Um, we see a lot of part-time entrepreneurs coming, right? So people that have a day job and then run the tech startup at night on the weekends, um, which is great early on, but for us, we need to have at least one or two people sort of full-time in the business um, because otherwise it's just not gonna get the traction that's needed. Um, needs to have a sizable market, right? So if it's a very small niche with a very small up upside, um, it likely will become more of a lifestyle business that has one or two people living off of it, but it's not going to create a lot of jobs as the market is just not big enough. Um, if you haven't done any validation or what we call traction, if you don't have any customers using it or customers paying for it, or at least have very, very good strong indicators that people will use this and pay for it, um, then it's just you speculating that it will be a big success, which, which isn't something that we really get excited about. Um, you need to have a bit of a plan in place. What are you gonna do to grow the business? Um, is there more than one person involved, right? Uh, usually we look for companies that have both strong business leaders and staff and technical. Um, so the, the bare minimum is almost the, the two co-founders that are both technical oriented and, and more on the business sales side. Um, and do you have some money to fund your portion? Well, we talked about that. And then of course be Canadian. So that's, this sort of gives you a good idea of where you start seeing tipping the balance in favor of companies that we typically support, which is hitting a lot of the boxes on the, on the right. Fair enough. Uh, just a clarifying question. Um, you've got single founder um, on the, the left side. Um, is that just referring to the, there's one person in the business? I mean, if, if there's a single founder that has then grown a small team. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. That's so fine. you have to okay. have, if, if it's a team, yeah, it's, it's more the, the, if the company is one person mm -hmm. and, and we see it a lot when people contact us, I mean, it's just not really a good setup to grow a business, right? It's uh, so, so it can be the start of a potential company, Yeah. but it's probably a bit too early for IRAP to support that. Fair enough. Um, and then what's required in the business plan? Um, are you, you know, is a one page business plan fine, a, a slide deck, uh, or does it have to be a, a weighty 200 page document um, or something in between? Yeah, definitely not uh, the weighty portion, right? So for, for tax startups, we often yeah. see sort of them going through some kind of program where they end up having the lean business canvas, mm -hmm. sort of the one pager um or or a slide deck um we ju we're just looking for companies that have sort of thought through beyond the technology or the product right it's uh there's still a lot of entrepreneurs that will come to us and and have spent all of their time thinking about the product and building the product but then when you ask them okay how are you going to sell this who is your competition what's your go-to-market plan what's your business model pricing strategy um those are the questions that they need to be able to answer and, and, and show that there's some, some thought put into that portion of, of growing the business. Fair enough. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. So our, our guiding principle um, that I mentioned before is to, to create wealth in Canada through technology. Um, our sort of internal ROI is, is what we call benefits to Canada, which is really job creation. Like that's, that's probably the single biggest thing that we look for is like, hey, if, if, if you're a company and you're in Canada and you have this great opportunity, how big could this grow? How many people would you employ um, in Canada, right? So, so we look very much for companies that um, can grow in Canada and create jobs based on innovation and technology. Um, so the other indicators of that, of course, I mean, jobs always follow revenue, right? So, so how fast is revenue gonna grow? Um, Often you'll need additional rounds of funding. So, so how well are you suited to start raising uh, investments and get people to invest money in it, whether that's a domestic or international or, or VCs or angels. Um, so they're all sort of interlinked. 
Um, we do have some programs in place that are specifically to help companies uh, develop new products or solutions to go after um, markets outside of North America, right? Whether that's through a collaborative effort or just sort of tweaking the product. So that's, that's something that's high on the agenda from a government perspective. Um, and then new opportunities for growth. So if you're a more established business um, that has a product in market already, if you can take that product and go after a new market or a different vertical um, or a different export market, uh, those are also good uh, projects that, uh, that can be supported by IRAP. But yeah, in the end, it all comes down to job creation and, and helping companies grow. So the last couple of slides is more so the informal things that you should keep in mind as you start working with IRAP. Um, so we often ask people, when is a good time to apply? Um, we don't really have specific intakes or call for proposals or things like that. So it's, it's, it's open all year round. Um, but you have to keep in mind that it's about building the relationship with your advisor. Um, that's usually the first meeting. Uh, we get to know you, you get to know us. Uh, we very rarely give money away in that first meeting. Um, but having that engagement and, and knowing where you're at is the starting point. And then over time, as we get to know you better, as we see you grow, um, at some point, we might decide, hey, we want to fund this company. Um, so it's, it's always a good time to start talking to IRAP. But yeah, don't expect, if, if you need money in the next six weeks, then uh, IRAP is not the place to go. Um, we are federally based, so our, our fiscal budget runs from April 1st until the end of March. Um, so obviously, April 1st um, is when we get our new budgets allocated, but that doesn't mean that that's the best time to talk to us. We will often start allocating that money uh, a few months in advance, right? So between December and February, we'll often make decisions on which companies we're gonna fund um, come the new budget in April. Um, so there's there's a bit of a lead time, right? And, and we make that decision based on knowing you, which means that a few months before that, we've, we've been engaging with you. That was me oh. getting very excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, how's that? Having a cable. Um, it, yeah, so. so quite dramatic from this side. <laughs> <laughs> so the so the real so, so the the short term answer is that like the best time to start talking to IRAP is right now um, because you need to start building that uh, that uh, relationship. Has, um, has anything changed in 2020 with all the the COVID going on and different? Um, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a, I think my last slide is specifically okay. about I'll what's different this year than yeah. than normal years um, because yeah, COVID did did affect us a little bit. Sure. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that. Um, we talked about the matching funding. Um, again, IREP is often there. IREP isn't there to fund your business. Like you should have other sources of funding. We're there to help you typically accelerate your growth, right? So by putting more fuel on the fire, so to speak. Um, so yeah, if you're coming to us as the last measure of resorts to keep your business alive, um, you're probably going to be very disappointed. Um, but if you say like, hey, I'm growing, this is my plan. If I got more funding, then I'll grow faster. That's the story you want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, any anytime we look at projects or decide on funding, um, the R&D outcomes and technology is important, but it's just as important to tell us how you're going to commercialize that solution, right? Like, how are you going to sell this? Um, how are you going to generate the revenue once you've delivered on that project? So have your, have your sales and marketing um, story lined up when you talk to us. Um, this is an unwritten rule, but most ITAs sort of adhere to it. So, so we very rarely will fund the salaries of founders and senior executives. I mean, we're there to help you. Again, that should be um, coming out of your operational budgets um, or bootstrapping. But, but yeah, we're there to help you hire more people to do the, to do the heavy lifting on the R&D side. Um, so I've, I've, I've heard many people say that when you start meeting with, with angel investors, you should never ask for money. You should always ask for advice. And then as they like what you're asking for and get to know you, they might give you money. Um, so the same is kind of true for ITAs, right? It's, uh, is, is, is engaged with us. 
and don't just treat us like a like an ATM, right? Um, see how you can use our advice and our knowledge and our our connections to help you go to business, and then at some point we might uh, provide funding to you as well um, because we like what you're doing and we see the and we like the opportunity. Um, that said, all of the things before us, like we're still an R&D based, like all of our funding is for R&D activities, right? So we cannot fund marketing and sales activities. Um, so you still need to have a good story around your technology and, and create some IP ideally uh, with the use of the IRAP funding. Um, this is specifically for software companies. Um, so that's that big group of companies that we support just because there's so many software startups. Um, that's where you get more competitive. So it's, it's, it's almost a requirement right now that you sort of bootstrap yourself to have a prototype, an MVP, um, something that's in market and has some people using it um, because you're, uh, you are competing with companies that already have that, right? So um, if, it's, if it's just at an idea stage and you think you've got the greatest things that, that, that the world has ever seen, well, go out and prove it, sign up some people um, that are willing to pay for your product and demonstrate that you have something with product market fit. And then IREP would be used again to accelerate your growth after that. Um, and, and, and with anything, as you're meeting with people from IREP, with, with the advisors, um, don't oversell what you're doing. Um, make sure you can back up your claims, be honest and realistic about the information you share, right? It's, it's, it's all in confidence with us. Like any time you meet with an advisor, it's covered by privacy policies and we cannot share it. So you need to give us the real look under the hood, uh, not the sales pitch that you have towards other investors or other, other potential customers, right? So be, 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 be truthful when you uh, ask for our support. And then also, um, we're often looking at doing smaller projects first to kind of get to know you, right? So, so don't ask us for like $5 million to, to cover your technology roadmap, uh, because that typically is not going to happen. Um, but if you say, hey, here's a specific area that we need help with, we don't have the funding or the resources to do it now, but if IREP could help us hire one or two additional people, we can go about and do that uh, this year instead of waiting until next year. That's the kind of sort of small project where we can make a difference and have some impact. That would be a really good fit. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, from, from our firm's perspective of working with a lot of companies like this, the key takeaway there is to set up your financial back office uh, to track projects. So get good at this. Um, tracking, tracking time to projects, tracking expensive projects, set up your books this way, use the functionality in there, uh, and that'll make things a lot easier to, uh, to think this way and to participate in the, in these programs. Yeah. So I'm trying to see what the next slide, okay. Yeah, so this I think is the last one. Um, so everything I just said is kind of, I wrap in a normal year. This is obviously not a normal year. Uh, because of the COVID crisis, uh, we did a lot of special things or different things this year. Um, one of them, IREP, had what's called the Innovation Assistance Program, which was a wage subsidy um, that was executed uh, between April and, and, and June. So that's currently closed. But I believe that in BC specifically, I think over 80 companies were supported with that. Um, there's ongoing technology challenges that are sort of co-managed between IREP and Innovation Solutions Canada. Um, so they keep posting new requirements as they, as they come up. So that's, that's something that you want to look at if you have a COVID specific solution that you might want to get support for. Um, the last two things are probably more uh, relevant for most companies that deal with us because um, the one thing we were asked to do is, was to accelerate the allocation of our funding um, to support the economy. So, so at this point, um, IREP is pretty much fully allocated for the funding that we have available this year. Um, now, does that mean you shouldn't talk to IREP? Like I said before, the best time to talk to IREP is today to start building that relationship, right? So, uh, but yeah, just be aware that um, the availability of funding this this fiscal year is is currently very limited because we've spent most of it in support of companies uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, we also prioritized some COVID specific projects, of course, uh, they, they, they were accelerated and got additional funding to, uh, 
to to, to support uh, solutions in that area. And then what we typically do is we meet with companies at their site um, to get to know them better. Um, we've obviously been doing this remotely um, with, with calls, et cetera, which isn't the greatest way to start building relationships with, with advisors, uh, between advisors and companies, but it's the best uh, we can do. Uh, but we're very slowly getting back to being allowed to start meeting with companies, um, especially if it's critical for an ITA to go and visit your site um, to look at sort of what you're building and what you're engineering and things like that, right? So we're we're slowly getting back into the meeting in person, but uh, but yeah, for now most of it is still remote with uh, with virtual sessions. Very good. So I think that's it, except for the contact page. Um, there's there's information about IRAP, but many other government programs. So the the single best source of this is the innovation.canada.ca website. Um, and to contact one of my colleagues that are that are in Ottawa in the call center um, with this number, they'll take down your information. They they get all the basic information about your company, and uh, they're also able to to tell you about a lot of other programs in addition to IRAP that you might uh, qualify for. So that's uh, that's that's the best way to get in touch with IRAP uh, because they kind of take down all your or all your core information and then they find the best advisors for you to work with based on where you're located and which industry you're in. Perfect. Um, thank you very, very much for that, Erica. There were a couple of questions uh, open before I turn it over to Richard. Um, so one is, uh, is there a link for the slides? Um, yes. So if you follow Entreflow on LinkedIn, um, you'll get a notification when we're posting the slides and the recording and other links and resources related to this uh, and other QT chats. Um, so they will be available. And uh, the other question was about um, uh, feeling maybe a little too early stage um, uh, on the left side of the plus minus uh, slide. Is it too early to start talking? Um, I think the answer is, is no, it's never too, too early. Start talking, build the relationship. Um, Colin, go ahead. You had a, a comment or question? Yeah, I just wanted to say, Eric, that was amazing. You just consolidated that down with nuggets of wisdom with slides there of what you're looking for and what you're not. And I can say with when I put on my entrepreneurial hat and our journey, it's saying five years ago and we started looking at IRAP, we were asking all the wrong questions and probably annoying some of your uh, your colleagues also and taking quite a while to, to learn at what stage uh, and what offering we had to be at. So we were actually wasting our time uh, and also your own. So I think that was great. I would love through Start of Vancouver to take uh, not only the slide deck, but perhaps uh, present that also, because I think that information for entrepreneurs at all stages is just incredibly helpful. So, so thank you for passing along your, your knowledge here today, Eric. All right. Oh, you're welcome. And yeah, if there are other opportunities to share this information, it's uh, role is available to, to help out with that. Perfect. Okay. Without further ado, because we're running a little short on time, I want uh, Richard to have a, a chance to tell us all about uh, shred. So go ahead, Richard. Okay, uh, Eric, I'd just like to thank you for that. I, I thought that that was the most concise and clear description of IRAP and where it sits and how it works that I've heard. So thank you for that. Um, let me go on to the, the next slide. So up until last year, I, I was running a, um, a fairly large organization, and which was uh, part of the Lead Corp Corporation. And if I had known now, uh, then what I know now, um, I could have saved an insignificant amount of money for the business I was running at that point. And I could have made, um, I could have impacted the bottom line. I could have been able to fund projects all because of the things I now know. And I'm going to try and share some of the stuff that we have figured out and we, we, we achieved for our clients. So I'm going to go through innovation and description. I'm going to talk about where it sits in the Canadian tax law. Um, I'll give you a, a brief overview of CATAX itself, but that isn't the purpose of this presesentation. Uh, I'll talk about the opp opportunity. I'll talk about the approach we take. Let me first of all say that uh, when it comes to Shred, any company of any size, and when I say company, I mean individual, in, individual entrepreneurs, and I also mean limited partnerships, um, and I mean public companies. So every scale of company that pays tax in Canada is covered by 
what I'm about to talk about at differing levels, at differing percentages. So the ultimate definition of innovation is executing an idea that addresses a specific challenge, achieves value for both a business or customer and creates competitive advantages for Canada. The purpose of this program is to change Canada's competitive edge in the world. That, and, and from that point of view, it's very similar in its, in its mission to, to IRAP. Next slide, please. So one of the, you can all read, but the one thing I, uh, that jumps out at me every single time is only about 2% of the com companies in Canada claim SHRED credits. SHRED stands for, for Scientific Research and Experimental Development. Only about 2% of companies actually claim. And between them, they, they share about $3 billion. Um, unlike IRAP, where you uh, where, where basically there's a bit of a lottery, you have to have a great idea, you have to have a good leadership team, you have to have it all lined up um, to be applicable for it to apply to you. With Shred, it's very very predictable. If you are doing certain things, and I'll talk about those in a moment, if you are doing certain things, Shred will apply to you, and providing you have an authentic genuine robust if you like claim you will get a get money back from the government against taxes um it'll either come as a credit depending on whether you're a public company or depending on your size or it'll come as a check if you're a smaller entity so this is a very very important opportunity for people who are starting up their business now you have to have an, a year end. That is um, the minimum that you you know the, the time when you you can actually start claiming for shred. You have to have had a, a year complete. Any company that you work with that's gone public that creates a stub year, and you can claim for before the the year end, or before that stub year end when you went public, and you can claim obviously on a slightly different program for your public company as well when you get to the next year. Next slide, please. Um, why do Canadians underclaim? Well, I think it's fair to say that if you, anyone who tries to read the shred uh, law um, documentation, it is astoundingly ambiguous. And at the same time, it's very rigorously managed. So when you hear people talking about it who've been through the program, they talk about it's taken them 40, 50 hours of work, and they got a review from the CRA, and it was not a very comfortable experience. Um, it's also not typically your accountant's strength. Now, that doesn't mean that accountants don't do a great work, a great job of it, but the, if you think about the way that an accountant looks at the world usually, revenue, take away cost, equals profit and loss, dispersals, accruals, PST, GST. It's one set of logic, one logical path of numbers. When we come to shred, if you start from the numbers and you work back, you usually find yourself getting yourself into trouble. What we've really got to do is we've got to find a really robust story that fits the objectives of the government. And then the very last thing we do is we go and ask for the numbers from the accountant to tell us how much that trip was worth, how much those consumables were, how much uh, these salaries were, et cetera, et cetera, or the, the research you did with UBC or the whatever it might be. Um, so when what we find is accountants are in, in reality our greatest introducers. Um, mostly because the way that we work, we work on contingency. So if if you don't get a claim that's successful, and therefore we have to be make make sure that what we're doing is authentic and genuine and is going to help your business to be successful. But if we don't find something that's successful for you, we're not going to charge you any money. That's an uncomfortable place typically for accountants to to live. I've been as polite as I can on that subject. Uh, next slide, please. So CatEx, we have um, 14,500 clients, probably a little more than that now. 
Um, we've been going for over 10 years and we have about 130, 140 staff in one form or another, 120 in-house and maybe 20 um, consultant type staff uh, working for our business. They predominantly are back office people. They support clients in six countries and we have proven um, just uh, an exceptional service to create predictable outcomes for our clients. And that's the most important thing, the predictable outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, we have professional relationships, and as I said, we, we, we value our relationships with accountants above all else, because we help our accountants do a, do a, a job that, that is very time consuming and quite a painful process for their clients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, very similarly to what Eric was saying, we're not stuck in one business. In fact, in our world, we're not stuck in any business. Uh, more or less any business that creates and evolves and generates um, progression can, can apply with, uh, with, with um, Shred. Um, businesses of all types, all sizes, doesn't matter whether you're profitable or in your pre-profit state, and it'll work in any industry, providing we have an authentic, genuine claim. Next slide, please. Usually, so the examples of qualifying criteria, um, really, it's a wide variety, but we work on a lot of software development, of course, automation, failed and successful projects, um, the development of, re of innovative recipes, everything from acid to wine to beer to uh, a myriad to, to um, vegan foods to cannabis products, um, the development of, of innovative formulas. Um, pure science from that point of view. And it was Arthur C. Clarke who said, um, the purest sorts of science often, often come across as magic. And certainly we're working with companies that are really on the leading edge of the magic stuff. Uh, the development of new materials, whether that is um, alloys, whether it is uh, fabrics, whether it's uh, clothing in clothing, sports clothing, or, or any number of those sorts of things. A lot of innovative processes, people, people taking multiple days out of processes to enable their, their business to be more effective. The development of new and improved products and the development of environmental uh, products are very, very much in the forefront of the things that we're seeing right now. Next slide, please. So the amount of money that can be claimed um, is it differs by province and it different differs by the size of companies. Um, a business can claim for uh, up to two years of innovation going back, providing we can get to a year end within 18 months of now. So uh, anyone with a year end uh, at the end of January right now is, is, is adding a lot of stress to my business. Um, as you can imagine, we've got a few days left to go and every time we do a, do a claim, it takes 40 hours of work um, to get it through the system. So, so our, our technical back office staff uh, are beginning to squeak when it comes to that. Uh, but again, we, we certainly aren't aren't um, we aren't shy at going after the going after the process where there is a clear, authentic, clearly articulated uh, articulatable uh, claim. We will actually take it on even fairly late in the month. But again, this is something that it's, it's like a ticking thing. If you don't act, it will slip through your fingers. And it breaks my heart when, I, when I, I meet people who, for the first time, have heard about this. And their year end is December. And they, they've had a significant amount of money that they've invested out of their pocket into building and growing their business. That they really could go, they could go and dig out and dig out of the past and bring into the future. Which would fuel their future. It's such a, such a heartbreaking thing when you meet people and they've missed out. Next slide, please. So our process is, is quite a simple process. 
Um, we collect information uh, initially to make a, to, to give us a feeling that we're in, uh, we have an authentic claim. And, and I'll explain, there are five questions we ask and only five questions and those questions will, will, will tell us whether it is innovation. And innovation is one of those things that really, when you ask the right questions, it sort of stands up and punches you on the nose. And if it isn't innovation, you'll get you'll, you'll know that within the first 10 minutes. Um, we then ask, assess the projects to make sure that we're, because a lot of people early on in their business or, or the first time they do this, are totally certain as to when pieces of the innovation happened in which um, which month and whether that fits in the year. So we're working with our clients to make sure that that what we're claiming is genuine, authentic, and totally defendable. And let's face it, uh, your accounting numbers just don't lie when they've been closed. Um, we do a complete consultation, and we have uh, our senior tax consultants, they, they write the narratives. The narrative's the most important piece. Um, and from then we, then, we pass that over to our accounting people who go and look at the numbers and work with your accounting or finance people to make sure that we're able to create the right uh, document. We submit it and then predictably, um, quite often there'll be a review by the CRA and we welcome that. This part of the CRA that's involved in this are not trying to stop you getting paid. What they're trying to do is to make sure that what we're asking for is totally legitimate and authentic and it stands up and it, it stands up under its own, own um, weight as really innovative really, really innovative um, as, I, as I said we work on contingency so we have aligned objectives and we want to make sure you're successful we want to make sure you can claim the most but we also want to make sure your reputation and our reputation remain absolutely robust with the CRA next slide please so in summary we have to be able to prove that you did what you did on purpose. Uh, we have a client, a magnificent client, who does all manner of innovation. But one thing they have is uh, they happened upon a very natural um, yeast. That yeast is so strong that it carries their wine through the whole fermentation process. You can't claim for, the for, for, for being fortunate to find this great yeast uh, in the vineyard what you can claim for what you do with it, in, in, in how are they protecting it, how are they commercializing it, how do they look after and make that into a product or into a value that goes forward. Um, we have to be able to see that the people who are involved are, are expert at their field. So I probably could build a car. I've never built a car and it would probably take me an awful long time and it would be probably pretty awful that can't be claimed because it might be a hard and really innovative thing for me to do but the reality is there are people who could do that and can do it every day of their life and they'll do it very well what we're looking for is something that is pushing the industry forward and is hard for an expert to do and we're looking for the thing that the expert is trying to do that is above and beyond we want to see that there's a risk of failure and that's, that's really important. And the best form of uh, proving that there's a risk of failure is actual failure itself. Trying something and then having to pivot away from it because as you got to a certain point, the information revealed itself that this wasn't gonna work and then you had to pivot away and outthink the next part of the process. Those are the, the ideal type of claims where you're constantly thinking and coming up with new ideas to overcome the next level. So we're looking for a progression, or, or as I would normally say, iterative reviews. We want to see a prototype. We want to see that prototype move forward in each step along the way. And as it, as it moves forward, it gets better and better and better. The final thing we, is we need to be able to document it. And we need to be able to document it. Um, we can go forward with as many uh, programs as we wish, as many claims as we wish, but each claim has to be documented within 1500 words. So again, we, we always prepare it as if the CRA are going to come and look, because they probably are, and therefore everything we, everything we write is as if there is a full audit coming, and we have all the backup documentation, everything lined up to make sure that we're, we're, we are robust in our claim.
Um, Ian, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Do you have any questions? Yeah, we're, we're at time. There were a couple of questions as you were talking, so I'll try and address them as quickly as possible. And I think I'd better handle them um, because they're how do you find a good shred, shred consultant? And I don't think Richard can answer impartially on that. Um, you always call me. <laughs> yeah, call Richard. He'll tell you which one to work with. No, um, there, are, there are a lot of charlatans in the business. There are. You are so, looking for someone whose customer, I would say, whose customers are going to stand up and say, they did a good job. Yeah. Um, and I, further to that is, is ask other people in the innovation community. Um, ask your accounting firm. Um, ask, ask your ITA. Ask, um, uh, you know, some uh, business advisor or, or your angel investor. Um, there, if there are people who are doing good work in the community, they will be known by reputation and you'll be referred to them. Um, it does, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to talk to a couple of people to find uh, a good fit uh, for you. Um, you'll have to make sure that you're um, and if you have collaborate a good, well together. And yeah. if you have a good one, hold on to them by the ears. Don't let them go <laughs> because there are so many. There are so many people who have done one or two claims. They're here, here one day and gone on the next. It's yeah. really um, and the other questions were around how does your accountants or specifically Entreflow in our role as uh, accountants um, collaborate with or work with the uh, Shred Consulting Firm? Um, so thing number one is, is we can try and point you to, uh, to a good firm to work with. Uh, thing number two is um, if there is a clean set of books and well-prepared financial statements, um, it doesn't necessarily make the Shred Consultant's job easier. There's still a lot of work to do to prepare the application, but it will uh, invariably make them able to claim for more things. So it's very clear that this is part of this project. If it isn't clear that it's part of this project, then they won't be able to put it as part of the claim. So it's to your benefit to work with a really strong accounting firm to get that and get the information over to the uh, Shred Consultant. Um, you can claim on your own. It's just difficult, takes a lot of time. Um, your accounting firm probably won't do this um, on their own. They'll probably want to collaborate with a shred advisor for all these reasons that we've just talked about. Okay, um, so we're way over time. Uh, so I'll have to wrap up here. Um, just wanted to point out that uh, next week we're going to be talking about branding and we've got uh, Carly Cunningham, who um, some of you might know uh, her name in the community and she's going to be talking about um, branding in 2020. Uh, of course, Colin's already posted in the chat if you scroll up about the uh, what keeps you up at night um, chat coming up. So scroll up, click on that, and you can join those things. Um, and here's all of our contact information. And um, as I put this up there, I'll uh, just say thank you to everybody who, uh, who joined on. Um, thank you for asking questions, uh, bringing your, your situation to the table. And, and biggest thank you to both Richard and Eric uh, for joining on and sharing all your knowledge and insight about these two wonderful programs. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks.